Thanks for joining us for another episode. Treasure rejection. It is wonderful and it is hard. It's an extremely hard gig that we signed up for yeah. to help someone else to sit there. Write what they want to write and not about what they should write. Oh, Forever. instant motherhood. Listen up. This is the Rose Quinn Podcast. That's my husband. My wife's amazing. Listen to her. (laughs) All right, everybody. We are in for another episode of the Rose Quinn podcast. We have the lovely Jillian French as our special guest today. And her most recent novel, The Missing Season, just came out on the 21st. If you follow me on Instagram, you saw my post about it. And it is one that you do not want to miss. But before we get to the interview I want to share my favorite books with you of the episode I recently got an arc of the vanishing season by Dot Hutchinson which I posted about on my Instagram post a review of it it's the fourth book in the collector series and the first one is the butterfly garden and this I haven't read the middle two books Hutchinson does a great job of weaving these really creepy mystery stories with these really relatable and kind of broken characters. The Butterfly Garden is where you should start, obviously. It's the first of the Collector series, and I think it's on Kindle Unlimited, too. So if you subscribe to Kindle Unlimited, you can get it right now for free. Um, but I'm going to read you the blurb for The Butterfly Garden by Dot Hutchinson. Near an isolated mansion lies a beautiful garden. In this garden grow luscious flowers, shady trees, and a collection of precious butterflies, young women who have been kidnapped and intricately tattooed to resemble their namesakes. Overseeing it all is the gardener, a brutal, twisted man obsessed with capturing and preserving his lovely specimens. When the garden is discovered, a survivor is is brought in for questioning. FBI agents Victor... Hanoverian and Brandon Edison are tasked with piecing together one of the most stomach-churning cases of their careers. But the girl, known only as Maya, proves to be a puzzle herself. As her story twists and turns, slowly shedding light on life in the butterfly garden, Maya reveals old grudges, new saviors, and horrific tales of a man who'd go to any length to hold beauty captive. But the more she shares, the more the agents have to wonder what she's still hiding. I remember reading this, I read it a couple years ago, a few years ago, on my first like Kindle Unlimited kick, and I love this, any novel that does like a dual timeline where you know what happened at the very beginning, but then you see what, then you see the present, and then you see back in the past and kind of what led up to the shocking beginning. I don't know why, but I have always loved that. So The Butterfly Garden is really an awesome, very disturbing at times book so be careful if you're sensitive to those sorts of things but this series is is pretty great and each book is um, based on a different crime and different central characters which is pretty great one other thing I wanted to talk about before we get to Jillian is social media and I'm really thankful for social media both Instagram and Twitter Um, met I've met a lot of wonderful people through both of those websites who I consider friends and I've connected with so many authors through this podcast through social media and feel really lucky to be able to do that um I saw just something kind of unfortunate happen um recently and I don't want to get into too much specifics of it but basically I just think we all could use a reminder that that stereotypical phrase that you hear if something you put something on the internet it stays there forever is very true i just saw a really unfortunate example of of somebody in the publishing world who posted something that really backfired on her and um i don't have a lot of background on it but ended up you know having some really serious consequences and a loss of a book deal and i think it was a really good reminder for me with this platform that i have in the podcast and the book reviews and all that to be very mindful of what I post and the things that we all do and the things we all share or maybe complain about or um, 
you know, share our opinions on. I think it's good to be careful, um, not because we need to be afraid of it, but I think, you know, it is a business when it comes down to it. Having a book published takes a really long time, it takes a really long time to get an agent and to get a book deal and then to have all those pieces come together. And it would just, it's heartbreaking to see that um, be lost for somebody. Just a good reminder for me and for all of you guys to remember that the platform that you use for your book reviews or for your, um, you know, as you aspire to be an author or as you already are, author, self-published, published, traditionally, you know, be mindful of who's paying attention and that anybody can see what you put out on the internet. So now let's get, now that I have the, like, boring stuff out of the way. Let's get to Jillian French. Um, her book, The Missing Season, I found on Instagram just a picture of and a just, you know, the blurb and I was in love. I was like, I need this book right now, but it was six or seven months out. So I am not a patient person, but I, I waited and I got the opportunity to interview her, which is super cool. So I'm going to read the blurb for you and then we'll get right into the interview with Jillian. The Missing Season, which is out now, is about this. Whenever another kid goes missing in October, the Pender kids know what is really behind it, a horrific monster out in the marshes they have named the Mumbler. That's what Clara's new crew tells her when she moves to town, Bree and Sage, who take her under their wing, Spirited Trace, who has taken the lead on this year's Halloween prank war, and Magnetic Kincaid, whose devil-may-care attitude and air of mystery are impossible for Clara to resist. Clara doesn't actually believe in the mumbler, but as Halloween gets closer and tensions build in the town, it's hard to shake the feeling that there is that there really is something dark and dangerous in Pender, lurking in the shadows, waiting to bring the stories to life. Isn't that amazing? Well, I'm so excited. I have it sitting on my shelf, and I can't wait to read it. Um, and I can't wait for you guys to learn all about Jillian and listen to this interview and make sure you go and buy The Missing Season right now. I remember um, in my constant search of books, I looked and and saw a blurb for The Missing Season, which is your upcoming um, novel. And I was like, this sounds like everything I love in a book. Give it to me right now. But then I was like, oh my gosh, I have to wait so long for this book to come out, which is always like... Uh, you know, hard on a reader's heart, but I'm really excited about that one. Well, great. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I tried to make it, you know, one of those labors of love that is also, you know, stuff that I'm crazy about and can't get enough of, like Halloween and Spooky Woods and small mill towns, you know, things like that. So yeah. um, I hope it works for you when you read it because it was fun to write. I'm sure it will. Will you tell us a little bit more about it so everybody else will get just as excited? Yeah, um, The Missing Season is a YA mystery set in central Maine, which is also an homage to horror movie tropes and urban legends. Yeah. Uh, whenever another kid goes missing in October in the small mill town of Pender, Maine, um, the teens know what's really behind it, a monster out in the marshes that they call the Mumbler. Um, new kid Clara doesn't believe in the Mumbler, but as Halloween gets closer and tensions build in the town, it's hard to shake the feeling that there really is something dark and dangerous and tender. It's about being a new kid in a town that's fading away and uh, about the stories we tell to frighten and entertain and how these stories can sometimes develop a life feral. I love it. Oh, that sounds so amazing. I really am so excited to read it and then for it someday to be a movie so that I can watch it too. I already know I'm going to love it. That's how confident I feel in like how it has everything I love in, in writing and stories. So. Oh, that's great. I hope it doesn't disappoint. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I know I've built it up a lot now, right? So there's pressure, but I have no doubt. <laughs> But um, I'm so excited, and I want to hear about if you could share it with your journey to being published, because this is your fourth published novel, The Missy Season, correct? Yes, it is. Okay. So just uh, tell us kind of how, how you got to that, that first book being published. It took me 17 years of writing and shopping around failed books 
and getting very occasional minor short story publication credits before I signed my first book deal. I began writing books when I was 14, and I always took it completely seriously, even though my <laughs> early books were absolutely terrible. Right. <laughs> um, I, yeah. <laughs> they, they were disastrous, but I knew that I wanted to tell stories for a living. Yeah. But it was a long road developing my craft to the point where it could catch the attention of publishers and agents. My first book, Grit, was released by HarperCollins in May 2017, uh, and the process is still magic for me, and one that I'll never take for granted because it took me a long, long time to get here. That's so amazing. I think it's... I am a very impatient person, so I've been writing since I was, you know, about 14 as well, but I've always had this, you know, idea that it's going to be, like, magically fast and happen right away. Like, the first yeah. que- the first query letter you send, you know, I think we all have that kind of, like, I idealistic view of it. But, you know, mm-hmm. I've also had to really break myself of that and be like, it's 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 okay that it's going to take a long time because, you know, clearly it, I just need to learn a little bit more and whatnot. But in the same vein, I'm still very impatient. But I love to hear you know, stories that it does take a really long time and it makes you all the more grateful for it, right? <laughs> it really does. It does. And it, I think it's hard because the stories everybody wants to hear and the stories that get spread around are overnight success. Right. And when you hear that, you're like, I want that. I'm working hard. Where's my overnight success? You right. know, and it's just, I think that's very rare. You know, I don't think it goes that way for most people, but people, you know, Nobody wants to hear the, like, <laughs> slow and steady wins the race. I know. And, like, that's hard to swallow the time. I've heard another uh, author's story where she queried in January and queried only, sent out only like 10 query letters and got a book deal and signed and all of that. And I'm like, that sounds amazing. And I wish that could happen to all of us. But, uh, you know, a lot of other authors are like, I went through three agents or, you know, book deals that didn't go through and then books that, you know, you just had to move on from. And so it's nice to hear yeah. the, the, the majority of it the reality of it <laughs> yeah. yes I know it is hard when you hear those stories you're just like oh uh, my heart breaking into a million pieces but you know we're happy for them <laughs> yes <laughs> we are happy for them but I'm also happy for you that you know you were able to to push on and and really you know you know like not quit just because it didn't happen right away because now you have all these yeah. amazing books that have been published and won some awards and I think you know it really shows that you do got to stick through and as long as it's you know your passion and what you love it's worth continuing right yes absolutely I think that um you know if I had gotten published way back when I started I would be so embarrassed of those books you know <laughs> and at the time I would have been over the moon but it's like it's they weren't good enough yet. You know, yeah. they just weren't good enough yet. And, yeah. you know, it's hard to it's hard to accept that sometimes, but you just got to keep plugging. I love that. Um, so tell us about how you approached querying. You know, like, what would your, you know, like, how you did it, and then maybe now, looking back now, like, something you would have changed or done differently? What I did initially, this was back in the 90s, um, I so everything was still being done by snail mail. It was extremely unusual for a literary agency to accept anything through email. Yeah. Um, so I was mailing and paying all the postage. Um, I would, you know, put my big fat manuscript into the mail envelope. Um, I religiously purchased my annual copy of the Publisher's Market Voice, which was a huge home with all of the agency's contact info. And then um, later, you know, as the years went on, you know, 2000, it, it changed. Um, and I started... Googling those agent websites for email addresses mm-hmm. and working hard at crafting query letters that I hope would get agents interested in my book. Um, I did have some bites over the years. Um, I got very close, only to be turned down again and again. Uh, and basically, I just put my head down and slammed it against that locked door to the publishing world for decades. Um, it was really just stubbornness that kept me going. Um, what I would do differently now, if, you know, there but for the grace of God go I but but we're back to querying again because that's that's hard for me and I really I struggle with those query letters Um, I did I struggle so bad (laughs) oh it's so hard you gotta you gotta condense everything down into a couple paragraphs and that is tough um now if I were to do it again um and if you know if I was going to give somebody tips I would say just make that query letter as bulletproof as you can it's got to be short sweet and streamlined 
And part of the way to get there is make sure you read it out loud to yourself. Um, get a feel for the flow of the words. It has to be as grabby as jacket copy on any published book you find in the stores. And that's really what agents are looking for. They want to see that you know what this is and how it could be packaged. Um, definitely have somebody you trust read it before you start submitting. Yeah. Because when you rethink and rephrase something as many times as the query letter, minutia becomes huge and you become blind to larger issues of structure or tone. Yeah. And the, the last thing that I would definitely change is um, make sure you submit to agents in small batches of four or five at a time. Um, any more than that, you can lose track of who you sent to. Start making typos because you're trying to go fast and do too much or else be deluged in rejections all at once, yeah. which feels awful. I think those are all good tips. I think the query letter is something that you either excel at or you really struggle at. And for for me, I've had those same, you know, faults where I like went through a query letter, edited it over and over and over again. And then I sent it to, you know, like strangers on the internet to review, which is probably not the best. But, uh, you know, then you, you see that as a, the writer behind knowing the whole story like I was missing pieces of what I really should be putting in there you know you you're yeah, so it focused on it. yeah yeah it can be very hard to see these are the selling points what you love might not necessarily be the best selling point for the book and that's something that I think it just it takes time and it helps to have somebody on the outside who can give you their opinion definitely but I think sometimes strangers on the internet are not the best choice <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people can be so cool. They know, can when be. When they're hiding behind a computer and you can't get to them, they can be nasty. Oh, like, man, they're <laughs> so nasty. Um, well, I think those are all great <laughs> tips. I love the the one about query and only in, like, batches of four or five because I, I think that is definitely the worst when you get, you know, regularly on the on the daily a, a rejection email because you sent out, you know, 20 query letters and then you get all of those rejections back at the same time. And that can yeah. be a little rough to deal with. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you get home from a hard day at work, and you've got all this other stuff you have to do, and then there's this rejection just sitting there waiting for you, you know, it feels bad, but having it spaced out makes it a lot easier to deal with. Yes, I think that's great. So how does it feel, as you're preparing for your fourth published book from your first, is it any different, or do you still have the same, you know, stresses and anxieties about it? Um, It definitely has changed. Um. When your first book comes out, I feel like you're so blown away by finally achieving your initial goal that you just kind of walk around in a super with a silly <laughs> grin on your face, which is lovely. Yeah. Um, and then you learn about things like social media promotion, networking with other authors, what royalty statements look like, and how nobody knows who you are just because you had a book published. Um, and you need to find a way to sell many, many more books than you are in order yeah. to make your publisher happy. Um I don't know. My, my take on it is that the joy comes from sharing your stories with readers. That's the amazing gift that you receive through publication. But that goalpost moves further down the field with each book because you're learning more about the business end of it every day and setting higher standards for yourself. And that's how it should be. You know, I'll be striving for more. Yeah. That's awesome. I think that's something that those people who are wanting to get their first book published don't necessarily think about the, the, the long long game of it (laughs) yeah yeah you know it's like I was so focused on the actual writing of the book and the crafting of the query that was all I did I all I had was a personal Facebook account when I started I had never been on Twitter Instagram I was totally cool I was just like a total what I I was not interested in social media and you know that had to change like I mean just it has to change because if people don't know who you are they can't know about your book and they can't read it you know and so that's then you find, okay, I've got I've got a lot of work to do. Like, I've really got to find a way to get myself out there and make my book rise to the top amongst all of this really stiff competition. Yeah, and it's social media plays such a huge role in it now, too, which can be exhausting, um, but you got to get your name out there for people to see, and people spend so much time on those sites nowadays. Yeah, I mean, it really is. I just, I never anticipated it, and I think I'm more used to it now. Like, now that I've had a few books come out, I'm getting a better hold on, okay, you know, you've got to run giveaways, you've got to comment on people's posts, you've really got to get yourself involved, but also find a way to just do this once or twice a day and not be constantly looking at your phone because it just sucks all the joy out of life. It I does. mean, it can totally take over. Yeah, it does. It's it's a wonderful thing and it's a, um, 
a not so wonderful thing at times too but I've met met and yeah. found and connected with so many awesome writers and awesome authors on it so I definitely I definitely love it but I I try and set myself time limits because it's so easy I, I yeah. find myself just pulling it up to look at nothing and I'm like ah why am I on it I'm not doing anything you know like yeah. I need to put my phone yeah. down <laughs> yeah so you like chuck the phone away because you're like stop you can't yeah. stop yourself you know it becomes habit but you're right you know I mean you know I live in rural Maine I, I would never talk to any other authors if it wasn't for social media so there definitely is a good side to it too that is advantageous to authors who don't live close to urban areas definitely I love that um Okay, my next question is a two-parter for you. Uh, what is the hardest part of writing for you, and then what is the hardest part of being an author? My, my answer to that is sort of a combination. I, put, I have to push the two together because I, I find it. at this point it's the same, it's the same problem. At, the, awesome. at this point, for me, um, the hardest part of writing and being an author is shutting out all the outside voices. And that kind of does tie into the social media aspect we were just talking about. Um, I feel like every author makes the early mistake of reading reviews of their work, just random reviews by anybody. (laughs) Like going to Goodreads and reading the reviews. Yeah. (laughs) And you often wish to regret it, you know. Everybody gets negative reviews from somebody. But an author's first responsibility, in my opinion, and I'm trying to really ingrain this in my own daily habits, is to protect their creative soul so they can keep writing for the readers who do like their work um nobody has any business mucking around in the actual process of creation you know critics goodreads reviewers family friends nobody yeah um writing that first draft is the most personal experience an author can have with their novel so my challenge for myself now is to shut out the world and try not to second guess myself and doubt that I can do this job, which, you know, is easier said than done. Definitely easier said than done. I think, um, that's definitely a crucial part to it. And I think something we all struggle with, uh, imposter syndrome, I think comes very easily yeah. from letting those outside influence or just seeing, you know, other people's journeys and experiences, like those instant overnight successes can be like, ah, why mm-hmm. am I doing this? But I, I do yeah. think you know that first draft is definitely crucial you got to protect it shield it from the world like you would a little newborn baby (laughs) absolutely yeah Yeah. I think you're I think you're absolutely right you know you've got to protect it because if you don't get to at least enjoy that part of it what are you doing it for you know you can really lose yourself in trying to appease other people and you can't I mean it's just impossible so you've just got to please yourself like the saying goes you know that's what you got to strive for Right, and I think your best writing and your your writing that has your true voice and your most creative writing comes that way too because it's no fun to write just what you think will be a bestseller because a lot of other people are doing that and we want to hear the the unique, you know, stories that our brains come up with which sometimes aren't going to be for everybody. No book is for everybody, so. But you want to write the ones like The Missing Season that has all these awesome little parts, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you know, it is. It's the best way, you know, that, that's a good way to look at it. It's kind of like, I want to connect with other people who share my interests. Yeah. You know, so if they love the story, then great. You know, we both love this stuff. Yay. You know, that, that's fun and it's a great way to meet people. So, you know, it's a good way to look at it. I'm sharing this story with people so they can have fun too. You know, like trying to emphasize the fun is it can be challenging, but it's a good thing to remind yourself of every day, I think. Definitely. So on the flip side, now that you've told us the hardest part, what is the best part of being a writer and being an author for you? Um, for me, it's being able to share my characters with other people. Um, crafting characters and atmosphere is my favorite part of the process. And when I feel like I get the character just right, I want to introduce the world to them. Um, when somebody tells me that they loved a certain character or hated a certain character in my book, like it it's a total that's that's the payoff for me um it's it's all about the people in the story I love that I think you know your characters are very true to or and really special to like who who you are in your brain but I also think it's kind of cool to watch them evolve and grow and be like oh I started out with this little idea and now they grew into this whole person I think that's cool yeah, yeah, it's funny when you're when you change your mind, you know, you're part way through the book and you thought you knew where you're going and then character becomes more important than you planned or you know you just decided totally to go somewhere different because you're having so much fun with that character it really is part of you know 
the fun ride of creating a book. Definitely. So kind of on that vein of, you know, figuring things out, how would you consider yourself more of a, a planner, outliner, really stick to your structure of that? Or do you kind of write by the seat of your pants or somewhere in between? I feel somewhere in between. I don't outline or put everything down in writing before I start a book. Um, I feel that, I feel like that kills the excitement of discovery. Yeah. But these days, what with being a mom and having lots of things happening at once, um, I often dash notes out to myself in just a Word document so I don't forget things that occur to me because I, I will. My yes. head is so fuzzy. Of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I generally let the flow of the book pull me along like a current. Um, but sometimes I do get hung up and when I realize that I'm stuck and floundering, I have no idea what to write next. Where should I go now? Um, then I go back to that messy Word document and I just you know, face down and do a little disorganized brainstorming, just through the consciousness style, getting my thoughts out where I can see them. And then it usually only takes a day or two before I dislodge myself and decide which way I want to go. I love that. I think that's a great way to do it. I'm very, very similar in that way. I just take a lot of notes and of course have to write things down always because I will forget it five seconds after I thought of it (laughs) my phone is littered with those notes you know just a quick one line of something that I've thought of but I think you know I think this is a question that everybody has a different answer to a different process and that's what makes the writing world so beautiful is that we all can figure it out in the way that works best for us but I think it's sometimes a journey like I used to outline hard and stick to the outline and get so frustrated if you know my characters went a different way or something happened that was probably actually better for the story but I'm like no this is how I planned you know it has to go this way um so now I've definitely found something that works for me that's in between that allows me that flexibility of just sitting down writing and seeing where it goes and then doing a lot of revisions later on yeah, that that's great, because I feel like, I don't, I don't know if you feel the same way, but I feel like all you're doing is moving the time around, yeah. like, puzzle pieces. It's like, it's not taking more time, it's just more time spent at a different stage of writing the book. Exactly. Than people who maybe sit down and outline, you know, every single detail before they start. Yeah. They probably have a lot less revision, but they have to spend the time outlining yes. in the beginning. So I feel like it's just like, yeah, it's kind of whatever works best for you, which is another thing with easier said than done. When I hear about these super organized authors that have like that complete, you know, outline structure that they do, I just go, oh, that sounds like so orderly and nice, but <laughs> my brain's just so messy. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I, I definitely think you're right on that. I totally agree because I know a friend of mine, she spent an, a year on an outline. A year before oh she even gosh. she wrote Whoa. anything down. But, you know, I probably spend six months to a year sometimes revising something and going through and making sure it's right. So it is definitely yeah. just where we spend our time. But I can't imagine spending a year outlining. And, and that's oh what gosh. works for her. So it's just different for every single one of us. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It is crazy how how different it is. I think that a lot of people who um who love to read but don't necessarily write expect that there's going to be a one right answer. Yeah. On the way to plan your first book, you know, and it just there isn't. You mm-hmm. just have to try stuff and figure out what works for you most of the time. Yes, that is very true. Um, so I love how you said you you know your journey took seventeen years and you started really writing at the age of fourteen. Can you kind of tell us if you you know, kind of remember the circumstances surrounding when you started to write and your love of of writing and this dream to become an author? Yeah, my love of writing started when I was very young. Um, Before I started in school, um, just storytelling, really, more than writing because I didn't have the skills yet. But um, I was lucky enough to have parents who passed their love of reading onto my brother and I by always reading aloud to us tons and encouraging us to make up stories and my brother and I put together kind of a little comic book um that we would um we were there's this story about um fox and rabbit was one that we did together and we would draw the pictures and just have a few words you know what we could do and this is like you know in our first grade yeah after there um and that was really where it started and then continued right up through school um, once I saw that you could create your own world through words, that was it for me. And I knew what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I love that. I think that's so great. I think a lot of the times it definitely does come from 
a love of reading and seeing stories and then putting together them in your mind and just using that imagination is such a a wonderful thing. I have been an avid reader ever since I can remember and definitely due to my dad's influence, he loves reading and, and still does now. But I remember just connecting so deeply with books and being like, wow, I feel so known and like I can relate to these characters. I want to do that for somebody else. You know, I want to be able to yeah. write something that makes somebody feel the way I'm feeling right now. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. When you're so struck by the power of a story and you say, I want to do this. Could I do this? Right. <laughs> and then you're like, wait, people can do that and pay the bills? But it's like, you know what you want to do. You know, that's the dream job. It's right so there. the dream job. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um. So... I'd love to see and just hear if you could tell us a little bit about your revision process. How, you know, since you don't spend a year outlining like some people, you know, what is, what does it look like for you? What do you, I guess, what do you look at first, like in your revision? What do you tackle first and kind of how does that look for you? Um, with an ideal time frame, um, with no deadline hanging over me, um, I, feel like I've done all I can do and can't stand to read the manuscript one more time after I do about four drafts. Um, I set the first draft aside for a couple days after I finish it and just take a brief break to enjoy how to survive the journey. Yes. <laughs> and then I jump right back with major revisions. <laughs> We're preparing the plot, the big work. Um, yeah. Making things consistent, making things make sense because that's kind of you know, like I said, you know, I, I revel in the making of the, the characters and writing the dialogue and creating the atmosphere. And a lot of times the plot, like, I'll have to drop something, and I'll figure that out later, and I just keep going. Um, then the next two edits are more about refining the dialogue and making sure the characters evolve throughout the arc of the story in a way that is consistent and true to them. And, uh, yeah, I usually have that last, that last run through is just touching up, you know, the little teeny tiny point. And... At that point, I'm, you know, I'm tired of it. I feel like I'm not <laughs> seeing the story of the story anymore, and that means it's time to hand it off to the first reader, who is my husband. Yeah. I think that is a, a good process. I love to hear what other people do, because I feel like I've kind of been stuck in this mode where, I don't know, I feel like I edit it to death and change it too much to a certain extent, where, uh -huh. where I'm like, uh, is this even really the story that I meant to tell in the first place? You know, like it, yeah. there's some major aspects yeah. that have changed. So I just, you know, I think it's um, at a certain point you got to know when to stop, when to, when to when to shut it out and just let the let the book be done, right? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that I think that's something uh, that I have done, and that I've heard other people say before. Where it's like now, I think I'm changing things that maybe didn't need to be changed, and maybe it's not better. It's just different. Yeah, and I think that means put on the brakes you're done because your brain is tired yes. you know you need feedback from somebody else I think so you can get a sort of detached view yes. at that point because yeah so you definitely you could just go on forever you know if you just because you could feel for second guess yourself forever I think that's just how a writer's mind works you're detail oriented and you can just drive yourself nuts if you don't put it aside and say what do you think of it <laughs> right. whoever you trust as your first reader whoever that person may be um, and then it's like Whoa. I think you just, the cord is cut. Yes. And then the next time you look at it, you've got perspective. Yeah, I think that's very helpful. Perspective is definitely needed when you get stuck in these worlds that you've created and have a hand in everything, and you just kind of, your, yeah. your mind goes a little cuckoo. You need a break, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that. I, I love knowing other people's revision processes because that's something that's really been a struggle for me lately, so I, I want to know, you know, how I can make it better. Yeah, I think it's just, it's so hard to trust your gut, but I think when your brain and your heart goes, oh, I'm tired, when you sit down to look at it after you've gone through the last time, it, it's time to hand it off. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, so my, I want to throw in a question that I didn't uh, give to you, but something that I just think it, I love to hear what people, you know, authors say, but if you could give, you know, like one tip to aspiring authors or even published authors just writers in general what would your just like main you know word word of wisdom be let's say my word of wisdom for 
for anyone who writes um, is trust the muse. I would say don't question your own passions and interests. Just because something may seem like too much of a niche market or just not a broad enough appeal, don't let marketability stop you from telling your story. I love that. Because I feel like a lot of, you know, the classics that, you know, everyone now regards as high literature, it started that way. It's just something that somebody really deeply in their heart wanted to write just for themselves. Yeah. And then when they let it out into the world, it turned out that it did have appeal, even though it wasn't necessarily totally mainstream. So that's what I would say is, you know, don't question the news as hard as it is. Just tell that story the way you want to tell it, because it wakes up everything inside of you. Oh, that is beautiful. That is such a good... Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, that's such a good (laughs) reminder. I think... That is something that a lot of writers struggle with, and even I, you know, I have, I've writ, I, um, not written, wow, goodness gracious, it's too early, um, I, <laughs> um, I wrote this book off of, you know, I started this writing prompt, and I am dead, deathly afraid of zombies, and the idea of zombies, and they, but I love them, too, like, I love, you know, um, dystopian worlds, and, and all of that, so I wrote this, sure. this book that, isn't a zombie story. I like to say it's, you know, a human story set in a zombie world, but I love it. It is like the book of my heart. These characters are my favorite, my best friends. Like, I love them. And, you know, I queried it and had a, an agent who gave me some, some good feedback, but it kind of really, like, discouraged me because she said, she was like, well, zombies are over, so this is never going to get published. And I was like, Ah. Ah. I was like, oh, oh okay. my heart, what am I going to do, you know? <laughs> so I'm, I, I still love it, and I still, you know, um, I'm going to try and market it a little bit differently in my query letter to, to make it, you know, maybe them not focus so much on the dystopian zombie part of it, which I think people think is overplayed, because I, I still love it, and I will always, you know, love it and, and fight for it, but... Um, you know, I think it's it's just having that reminder. And I did get discouraged, but it took me a little bit to just be like, okay, no, I still love it. It's still my passion. I know there's people out there who would still read it. <laughs> and I just kind of got to keep yeah. going. Definitely. And, you know, I have heard that said so many times with various trends in books, you know, like, oh, this is over. Nobody wants to read that anymore. Yeah. Like, um, you know, what have you, uh, you know, any type of really like dystopian end of the world, yeah. you know, like when vampires were really big, but that stuff is still coming out. Yeah, you know? people still and love really, it. it. Yeah, and so if they, uh, an agent can make that statement, like that's something I would used to read in, um, I used to get Writer's Digest um, magazine religiously, and um, there would be uh, there'd be agents making a statement like that, or an editor making a statement like that, like that was the final word, and it's not, you know, because yeah, you're right, there's there are people out there who will share your love of it because I mean if something is that popular to begin with there's a lot of fans of yes. that genre. Yeah. Where do they all go? Right. <laughs> they didn't all just decide one day, oh, I'm done with dystopian books. I've seen too many I don't want to read them. Like, I still read dystopian books that I find that even if they weren't newly published, you know, they've been published a few years ago, but if there's a new one that comes out, like um, The Echo Room by Parker Peavy House was one, and I was, like, all over it. I was like, this is awesome. And, you know, it's a dystopian book, at, you know, like – at its core it's a future of a world that you know has gone downhill and is different from ours and but it was still published and really did a great you know had it has done great so I think I just need it took me a while though to take that to process that agent's feedback and to yeah, to recover yeah. to stitch my heart back up and be like okay no I can still do this <laughs> yes definitely yeah don't give up on it you know if you feel that passionate about it then somebody else will too maybe lots of somebody you know and that agent uh, that's just one person <laughs> right like, it's so hard because yeah that stuff hurts you know it's, you have to give yourself time to feel like crap about it and so usually how i give myself permission to feel bad yeah for a few days and then back on the horse you yeah. know it's, you gotta let yourself feel it because otherwise you'll crash later oh for sure and i and i did i took some 
some time away from it and then my husband was like what's going on like I feel like you're talking so negatively about writing and about like your you know your author journey and he's like I just he's like you need to you need to change that like you need to not give up and I was like okay I you know like he's all he's always very in tune with what's going on with my emotions which is helpful um That's wonderful yes yeah, so that yeah. that definitely broke me out of it a little bit I was like okay if he's seen it like if, if he can be positive about it I can too so I'm definitely getting yeah, there you know it's like it's like look at like Bird Box oh yeah That's dystopian and you know they make it into a movie for Netflix and like everyone's like oh my gosh and loses their mind and that book did so well anyways but it's like that that's dystopian that's basically zombies with a little spin on it right you know it's just kind of people going crazy becoming yeah. inhuman but you know because of this invisible alien monster you know that drives them insane but it's the same type of idea yeah so if you're like yeah i mean the idea here that you have a time to put a little different spin on it and have playback the fact that it's zombies it's really more about the people and the story here i think that's very smart yeah. and i think it, that works well it does. I think it's something that a lot of people like me have a fear of, but, you know, we want it, we like to read things that scare us and, and be immersed in those stories because I, I think it kind of helps you feel maybe a little bit more comfortable with it or to, to put it in this, you know, imagine imaginary box, like, helps you with the fear of it. <laughs> yes, yes, I think definitely. It's hard when somebody has kind of tried to extinguish your flame yes. with a story it's kind of been like ah pa-pa. you know that's very it can be really hard to get past that but you know walking dead is still on tv i mean yeah. how many seasons has that show been on and so many <laughs> people don't want to read those stories well, you know it's a, yeah that's there, a thing it's you know yeah there's a new zombie tv show on netflix too so that i'm not giving up yeah, hope last summer, right? <laughs> yeah yeah i'm not giving up yeah. hope it just it kind, you know, it hit me down a little bit to hear that, and yeah, so. no, I absolutely. <laughs> it, it's hard to soldier through that when somebody in the business says, "No, this has no chance." You know, it's like, how do you get past it? But you know, it's good. It's not like you gave yourself time to kind of feel bad and then build yourself back up again. And so, yeah, you know, keep going with it. If your heart feels that strongly about it, there's a, a good reason. Yes. Thank you. I love. You know, it's good to to get other feedback on it and help you know, me, me feel a little bit better about it. Um, so thank you for answering my question. That was kind of off the fly, but my last one for you is my favorite. I think I love to know what other people are reading, even though I have way too many books I already need to read, but, um, what is your favorite book or books right now? Uh, my favorite book right now is Since We've Last Spoke by Brenda Ruffner. Uh, it's the best YA novel I've read in a while. Uh, it deals with teens who have had their budding romance ripped apart by a tragic car accident involving their siblings. Wow. And I think she's tapped into a very sensitive, painful subject that a lot of us have gone through in one way or another in high school, losing someone in a car crash. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, Brenda writes with so much tenderness and poignancy, which is so well suited to the age group. And um, in the adult world, I'm working my way through the Mike Bowditch series, by Paul Warren, which is a mystery series set in Maine, and it's following a young game warden as he solves crimes and struggles with his personal life. They're very gripping page turners. Cool, I love that. I I love that. Um, you know, you're reading both adult and YA, which I think everybody does. I think everybody reads YA, whether they're a young adult or an adult adult. So, yeah. <laughs> yes, I think that's great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for chatting with us, and um, I'm so excited for the missing season. It comes out on May 21st. That's right, right? That's right, yes. The 21st coming right up in a couple of weeks. Oh my gosh, that's so soon. How is it already May? I know, I know. Where <laughs> did the year go? Oh my gosh. I know. Slow down. It's crazy. Crazy. Well, I really appreciate you asking me to talk. Thank you so much for having me on. Of course. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for tuning in to this episode. Please make sure to rate and review this podcast wherever you listen and make sure to follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at Rose Quinney, Q-U-I-N-N-Y. And if you're an author and want to be on the podcast or aspiring to be an author and just want to chat about anything and everything or share your favorite book, let me know and uh, I'd love to chat with you and get connected and get connected and get connected and get connected.